and exhibiting no very intemperate zeal in the matter of hiding their nakedness. When the missionaries first took up their residence in Honolulu, the native women would pay their families frequent friendly visits day by day, not even clothed with, with a blush. It was found a hard matter to convince them that this was rather indelicate. Finally, the missionaries provided them with long, loose calico robes, and that ended the difficulty. For the women would troop through the town stark naked, with their robes folded under their arms, march to the missionary houses, and then proceed to dress. <laughs> the natives soon manifested a strong proclivity for clothing, but it was shortly apparent that they only wanted it for grandeur. The missionaries imported a quantity of hats, bonnets, and other male and female wearing apparel instituted a general distribution and begged the people not to come to church naked next Sunday as usual. And they did not, but the national spirit of unselfishness led them to divide up with their neighbors who were not at the distribution, and next Sabbath the poor preachers could hardly keep continence before their vast congregations. In the midst of the reading of a hymn, a brown stately dame would sweep up the aisle with a world of errors, with nothing in the world on but a stovepipe hat and a pair of cheap gloves. Another dame would follow, tricked out in a man's shirt and nothing else. Another one would enter with a flourish, with simply the sleeves of a bright calico dress tied around her waist and the rest of the garment dragging behind like a peacock's tail, off duty. A stately buck canica would stalk in with a woman's bonnet on, wrong side before. <laughs> Only this and nothing more, after him would stride his fellow with the legs of a pair of pantaloons tied around his neck, the rest of his person untrammeled. In his rear would come another gentleman, simply gotten up in a fiery necktie and a striped vest. The poor creatures were beaming with complacency and wholly unconscious. Poor were, creatures sounds like they were having fun. Yeah, they didn't have any problems. It was the missionaries who were vexed as well they should be. Of any absurdity in their appearance, they gazed at each other with happy admiration, and it was plain to see that the young girls were taking note of what each other had on, as naturally as if they had always lived in a land of Bibles and knew what churches were made for. Here was the evidence of a dawning civilization. The spectacle which the congregation presented was so extraordinary, and withal so moving, that the missionaries found it difficult to keep to the text and go on with the services. And by and by, when the simple children of the sun began a general swapping of garments in open <laughs> meeting and produced some irresistibly grotesque effects in the course of redressing, there was nothing for it but to cut the thing short with the benediction and dismiss the fantastic assemblage. In our country, children play a key house, and in the same high-sounding but miniature way, the grown folk here with the poor little material of slender territory and meager population play empire. There is His Royal Majesty the King with a New York detective's income of thirty or thirty-five thousand dollars a year from the Royal Civil List and the Royal Domain. He lives in a two-story frame palace. And there is the Royal Family, the customary hive of royal brothers, sisters, cousins, and other noble drones and vagrants usual to monarch monarchy, all with a spoon in the national pap dish, and all bearing such titles as his or her royal highness, the prince or princess so-and-so. Few of them can carry their royal splendors far enough to ride in carriages, however, and sport the economical canica horse or hoof it, missionary phrase, with the plebeians. Then there is His Excellency, the Royal Chamberlain, a sinecure for His Majesty dresses himself with his own hands, except when he is r ruralizing at Waikiki, and then he requires no dressing. Next we have His Excellency, the Commander-in-Chief of the Household Troops, whose forces consist of about the number of soldiers usually placed under a corporal in other lands. Next comes the royal steward and the grand equerry in waiting, high dignitaries with modest salaries and little to do. 
Then we have His Excellency, the First Gentleman of the Bedchamber, an office as easy as it is magnificent. Next we come to His Excellency, the Prime Minister, a renegade American from New Hampshire, all jaw, vanity, bombast, and ignorance, a lawyer of shyster caliber, a fraud by nature, a humble worshiper of the scepter above him, a reptile never tired of sneering at the land of his birth or glorifying the ten-acre kingdom that has adopted him. Salary, $4,000 a year, vast consequence, and no prerequisites. Then we have His Excellency, the Imperial Minister of Finance, who handles a million dollars of public money a year sends in his annual budget with great ceremony, talks prodigiously of finance, suggests imposing schemes for paying off the national debt of $150,000, and does it all for $4,000 a year in unimaginable glory. Next we have His Excellency the Minister of War, who holds sway over the royal armies. They consist of 230 uniformed Kanakas, mostly brigadier generals, and if the country ever gets into trouble with a foreign power, we shall probably hear from them. I knew an American whose copper plate visiting card bore this impressive legend, Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Infantry. To say that he was proud of this distinction is stating it but tamely. The Minister of War was also in his charge has also in his charge some venerable swivels on Punchbowl Hill, wherewith royal salutes are fired with foreign vessels of war, when foreign vessels of war enter the port. Next comes His Excellency, the Minister of the Navy, a nabob who rules the Royal Fleet, a steam, tongue, steam tug and a 60-ton schooner. And next comes His Grace, the Lord Bishop of Honolulu the chief dignitary of the established church, for when the American Presbyterian missionaries had completed the reduction of the nation to a compact condition of Christianity, native royalty stepped in and erected the grand dignity of an established Episcopal church over it, and imported a chap ready-made bishop from England to take charge, a cheap ready-made bishop from England to take charge. The chagrin of the missionaries has never been comprehensively expressed to this day, profanity not being admissible. Next comes His Excellency, the Minister of Public Instruction. Next their excellencies, the governors of Oahu, Hawaii, etc., and after them a string of high sheriffs and other small fry too numerous for computation. Then there are their excellencies, the envoy extraordinary, and Minister Pellin Potentiary of His Imperial Majesty, the Emperor of the French, Her British Majesty's Minister, the Minister Resident of the United States, and some six or eight representatives of other foreign nations, all with sounding titles, imposing dignity, and prodigious but economical state. Imagine all this grandeur in a playhouse kingdom, whose population falls absolutely short of 60,000 souls. The people are so accustomed to nine jointed titles and colossal magnets that a foreign prince makes very little more stir in Honolulu than a western congressman does in New York. And let it be borne in mind that there is a strictly defined court costume of so stunning a nature that it would make the clown in a circus look tame and commonplace by comparison. And each Hawaiian official dignitary has a gorgeous, very colored, gold-laced uniform peculiar to his office. No two of them are alike, and it is hard to tell which one is the loudest. The king has a drawing room at stated intervals, like other monarchs, and when these varied uniforms congregate, their weak-eyed people have to contemplate the spectacle through smoked glass. Is there not a gratifying contrast between this latter-day exhibition and the one the ancestors of some of these magnets afforded the missionaries the Sunday after the old-time distribution of clothing? Behold what religion and civilization have wrought. Chapter 68
a royal funeral, order of procession, pomp and ceremony, a striking contrast, a sick monarch, human sacrifices at his death, burial orgies. While I was in Honolulu, I witnessed the ceremonious funeral of the king's sister, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Victoria. According to the royal custom, the remains had lain in state at the palace 30 days, watched day and night by a guard of honor. And during all that time, a great multitude of natives from the several islands had kept the palace ground.